right. So welcome to the Global Non-Community Geometry Seminar, which uh, this is the European note of. So uh, it's a great pleasure to have uh, Shamajit uh, to give his talk and, and maybe ask you to unmute. All of you uh, will not be speaking except uh, Sean, of course. Yeah, yeah, okay. And uh, that will be a, a talk based on a recent uh, paper with uh, Wips and Becks uh, on quantum geodesic flows and curvature. So go ahead. Thank you, thank you, Walter. So yeah, it's a great pleasure to be here. So I think most, well, not everybody uh, may be familiar with my background. So I'll just say very quickly, the kind of starting point from a physics point of view is, is the, what I call a quantum space time hypothesis that whatever quantum gravity is, it could be lots of different things. It has to get map onto classical Riemannian geometry and GR in some limit. And so the hypothesis is that on the way there, there should be some uh, version which models part of quantum gravity effects um, where the operators of the coordinates of space time are rendered uh, non commutative So this is completely speculative, but it is a very practical uh, hypothesis because it means you can build models using non commutative geometry. Now, the particular um, uh, framework of non commutative geometry, there are many kinds, and Noel Ancon is, is most famous uh, here and has spoken at the seminar, but uh, we will follow what I call a kind of, kind of constructive approach, um, which is described in detail in this book on quantum money and geometry, uh, which I'll, I'll say briefly what it is. Uh, but basically you start with the differential structure and then you build up the different layers of geometry and you may or may not arrive at a spectral triple at the end. Now, um, within any framework, but particularly within this quantum Riemannian geometry framework, the question I want to address is what is a geodesic? Now, if you're an augmented geometry, you know there aren't any points, so how can there be curves? Okay, so that's the first thing we need to address. And, um, and the answer is, I'll take a kind of fluid dynamics um, point of view um, in which uh, we have not one point, but a distribution of points, uh, like a probability density or more precisely an amplitude density whose norm square is the probability density. So we'll imagine that there is some sort of wave function over the manifold whose norm square is a probability and we might find a particle at some point. And then at each point, the particle will flow along a geodesic. So that means that the whole wave function will evolve. And so that's a quantum geodesic. This is uh, Edwin Beggs's idea in this paper, um, which we followed up in a couple of papers here. Now, um, this paper I might touch upon at the end if I have time, which is about applying this formalism to quantum mechanics, ordinary quantum mechanics, where the space, the non commutative space is a phase space of a quantum system. And then you can write Schrodinger's equation as a quantum geodesic flow. Uh, this one here studies uh, quantum geodesic flows on the uh, Kappa Minkowski space time and has some interesting physical effects. But today's talk is more mathematical, uh, will really be on the formalism and some uh, not really on the physics. Okay, this is this paper here. Okay, so um, firstly, the formalism, I think, for this particular crowd, I don't have to say too much. Is that I, I'm, I'm assuming, um, but we'll just, so I'll just say quickly that uh, classically a manifold, um, we, could we could really focus on the bit we need of a manifold, which is the coordinate algebra uh, of some kind, for example, smooth functions um, and, uh, and the differential forms uh, built from that. So you, have, you would have particularly um, a diff uh, degree, different degrees, degree zero would be functions, degree one would be one forms, and of course, there is a map from degree zero to degree one, which is the derivative. So this encodes the differential structure of the manifold. Now, classically, of course, they would commute with functions and there'd be a wedge product and D would extend with the graded Leibniz rule and it'd be graded commutative. So now of this non-commutative structure, we just keep that uh, we just keep the Leibniz rule basically. So we drop, we keep, we let the algebra be, be any unital algebra over a field. We drop the commutativity and graded commutativity but we keep that um, the associativity. So omega one, part of the associativity of the exterior algebra is that omega one is a bimodule. That means you can multiply a differential form by a function, either first with C and then from the other side or from the left and then from the right. So they should commute, that's called a bimodule. And there should be a map, once you've got a bimodule, you have a map D which obeys the Leibniz rule. And of course, omega one should be spanned by things like that. Otherwise you could just make it smaller. And then once you've got omega one, you can extend it to higher degrees by, quotient, by taking the tensor algebra and quotienting by some relations. 
and there's not a un there is at least there's a couple there's, there's one canonical way to do that which is generally too big so generally you've got to specify um, the higher degree calculus and I should say it doesn't capture all of the information of being a, a, a manifold there's a lot more structure for example a Dirac operator would capture more information than just this um, but this is the basic structure now um, the in this approach which is now perhaps less well known to some people, um, a metric is going to be an element of G1 tensor, uh, of omega 1 tensor omega 1. Now, if physicists, if you're mathematical physics, you would just write, or a geometer, you would write something like this. The metric is this kind of element here. But notice that this function G mu nu, this is like a one form tensor or one form. But this function G mu nu is, is only has, is, it depends only on one point of the space time. It's not bilocal, it's, it's locally only at one point. And that means that these two copies of dx, these, they live at the same point in the manifold. And that's, that's expressed here by saying it's a tensor product over the algebra A. So it's not in the tensor product over the field, it's in the tensor product over the algebra. Now you should have a, so that means it's a, it's a zero two tensor. Uh, now, a bimodule, it should be non-degenerate, and we express that by saying it should be invertible in the sense of a bimodule map going the other way, which is which are inverse to each other. So that's expressed by these snake identities. Um, but what they simply say is that if, if you imagine these are matrices, then this just says the matrix for G followed by the matrix for the RAM bracket is the identity matrix. So in terms, if you choose a basis, if you have a basis and you choose a basis, then this, and this just says that the tensors are inverse to each other. The tensor for or the, or the matrix for round bracket is inverse to the matrix for G, but this doesn't depend on on having a basis. Um, invertible uh, metrics turns out have to be central. Now I know there's a lot of people who don't like that, and uh, I apologize for that. But um, there are two ways you can see that. One is one is that you could say, well, it's a constraint on uh, from non-commutative geometry about which metrics can be quantized. Um, because it turns out that being central is a, once the algebra is non-commutative, uh, it's actually a strong constraint. So it means not every necessarily every geometrical metric uh, can be quantized in a way that remains central. Um, or you could view it as, um, and, and I tend to think there is some some physical some physical intuition behind that, which needs to be understood more. But more likely, it's just a stepping stone. You explore the central case first. When you relax centrality, you'll have to relax the existence of this inverse, and then you'll have some you'll have some more more complicated system. But you should explore the simplest system first before you explore more, more complicated systems. So that's the philosophy here. Now, a connection. Uh, well, a connection usually going back to Quillen and, and people is a left connection would just be instead um, a map like this. Now, normally a, a connection in geometry, you would have a vector field and then you would get a, an operator on, let's say on one forms. So if you give a vector field, you can evaluate it against omega one, and then you would have an operator. You have the corresponding covariant derivative. Now the, the covariant derivative of Leibniz property translates into this property here. Now, because, because omega one is a bimodule, we can also ask from the other side. And here you need an extra gadget because you can write down the Leibniz rule like this, but df lives on the wrong side. Everything has to be on the left because the left output of, of Nadler is, is where the vector field has to evaluate. So the vector field has to couple to df. So you need some kind of bimodule map um, that, will, that will flip, that classically would be the flip map. And so, that, so this was realized uh, by Duval Violet and Peter Michor and others some years ago. It's called a bimodule connection when this happens. Now I should say it's not additional data. It's just because if it because if it exists, then it's uniquely determined. So really, it is just a statement that some left module connections on a bimodule uh, extend naturally as bimodule connections, um, and some don't. Now, if you have a bimodule connection, then the other nice thing you can do is that the whole category of bimodule connections is a monoidal category. You can tend to product them. So for example, if I've got omega one a bimodule connection and and I look at omega one tensor omega one. Then I can I can define Nabla on the first on the first one, Nabla on the second one, and then I have to move the left output of Nabla to the far left, and that's done by sigma. So that's done in a diagrammatic form, uh, like this, over here. So in the diagrammatic form, um, it means I apply Nabla in the first place, I apply Nabla in the second place, and then uh, I, I should say I mean, read these diagrams going down the page. Okay, uh, and then I use the flip, the, the generalized braiding to put this in the right place. So now we know what it means for the metric to be metric compatible. We want nabla g to be zero. 
Okay, so this is why you have to use bimodule connections, I mean, to have anything that looks close to classical geometry. Now, so a levitor feeder connection will be a torsion free metric compatible connection. And what is torsion free? Well, again, when you do things in terms of forms, torsion, the torsion tensor just turns out to be the comparison of the two ways to go from omega one to omega two. So you can go directly with D, the exterior derivative, or you can go with nabla, and then you can apply the wedge product to go from omega one tensor omega one down to omega two. And so that, that difference is, is the torsion. Um, once you have a connection, any left connection, you've also got the curvature, which is just defined in the standard way. Um, so it's basically nabla squared, but adjusted so as to become a left module map. Okay. Now the uh, the other so that's a, that's a standard ingredient from non Euclidean geometry. Now the another thing that is special to uh, what we do uh, is the Ricci tensor, uh, because again, what is the Ricci tensor? So in the absence, the, the real problem here is that if you don't know mathematically sort of philosophically what the Ricci tensor is, then you don't know how to make it non-commutative. So at the moment, we just have what is we call a working definition, which is just a copy of the physicist definition. So, so you take the Ricci tensor. Now, the left output of the Riemann tensor, the left output of the Riemann is in omega two. You can't contract omega two, uh, but you can lift it to a two form, to an omega one tensor omega one, and then you can contract it. With, with the other side, so you can take a trace. So the usual trace formula in Riemannian geometry textbooks, you can replicate it, provided you can lift omega two into a pair of anti-symmetric indices. So cl classically, this map here, omega two into omega one tensor omega one, this would just lift a two form into an anti-symmetric pair of one forms, a sum of anti-symmetric one forms. And um, uh, let's just say, well, that's equivalent to having an interior product, but anyway, it's additional data. Given this additional data, you can define Ricci tensor, and then you can define the Ricci scalar. So this is the broad framework. I've done it very quickly because I know this audience is, is quite expert. Um, okay. Now, the thing which you will not have seen probably, uh, unless you read the papers, um, is that this notion of a bimodule connection, it actually applies much more generally. So let's just go back to this. First thing, we can replace omega one by any, any bimodule E. So you can have you can have omega lambda goes from from e into omega one tensor e. So that would be a connection on e. E is the sections of a classical bundle, uh, and you you could this would still make sense. But now sigma would go from e tensor omega one to omega one tensor e. Now that so that's just that's again fairly standard now. That's part of non commutative Riemannian geometry. But the thing which is special to the quantum geodesics is the observation that this whole thing generalizes even further you can actually let the two algebras be different. So you can let E be an AB bimodule. So now you've got one object, but you can multiply from the left by A and from the right by B, two different algebras. And you'll see why we need two algebras in a minute. So, uh, well, roughly speaking, this is going to model maps from one algebra, from the space of one algebra to the space of another algebra. So that's why you need two algebras. Anyway, AB bimodule connection. Now, um, so, so now nabla E goes from E uh, into, uh, that's actually going to be, uh, the other thing I'm going to do, which I should have warned you, is I'm going to flip left and right because it's just convenient to work with, with right module connections. So we take what I just described to you and then you also flip left and right. So if you, if you let A, B be A, then we just have a right module connection, by, right A by module connection, but now, we, 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 we fix, uh, we have a right module connection, but the algebra from the right is actually B. So it goes like this, but, but, but from the left, it's still an A module. So it's an A module from the left and it's a B module from the right. And this is an AB bimodule connection, a, a right AB bimodule connection. Now, so you still need that Sigma to make sense of the Leibniz rules. So you see it here, here is the straight Leibniz rule from the right. And now the Leibniz rule from the left needs a Sigma. You need a map from omega one tensor e into into e tensor omega one, but but it's, but here it's omega one of a, which I will write without a suffix, and here it's omega one b. So you have so you have two differential algebras, each with the exterior algebra, and uh, and this intertwines the two of them. Okay, now um, you have the, you you have again you have, you actually have a bi category now. You can tensor product, just as you can tensor product bimodules. Um, 
you can uh, you could uh, AB bimodules. You can tensor product an AB bimodule with a BC bimodule and get an AC bimodule. So the same thing applies with 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 uh, with bimodule with AB bimodule connections. And um, uh, and in particular, I want you to note that if uh, look at this map here, if omega one has if you are given a if you have a quantum geometry on omega one, you have a quantum Riemannian geometry. So omega one has um, a bimodule connection on it for the metric. Let's say levity beta bimodule connection. And uh, omega, let's suppose that omega, and omega, if uh, if omega one itself has a right bimodule connection, which we're going to do in a minute, uh, then we will have a tensor product one because we have the one on E, we have the one on omega one, we have the one on E, we have the one on omega one. So in both cases, you can tensor product. So you've got a pair of tensor product a, um, a B bimodule connections, and so um, so both sides of sigma have a have a tensor product a B bimodule connection. Now, in that case, we can ask that the map sigma intertwines them. So in general, if I have a map phi between AB bimodule connections, um, then I can ask if, if, if it commutes with, if, if the phi commutes with the connections. So in other words, I can look at this, what we call double nabla of phi, which is apply phi and then apply nabla on, on the output side, or apply nabla on, the, uh, nabla on the input side and then apply phi. So this just says that 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 it's a map not just of bundles but of bundles with connection, and uh, if it's zero, then we then we that says that it's it's a map of bundles with connection. That's what I meant to say. So another, if you were a geometer, then you could just regard a map like this as a tensor. You could put all the input side on the output side and regard it as an as a tensor e ten e star tensor f, and then we're simply asking that 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 as a tensor phi is covariantly constant under the tensor product connections. Okay, so again, these notions are somewhat familiar, for example, in the yellow book with Bex that I mentioned at the beginning. Um, actually, I don't sure I did I actually mention. Yeah, I did say that. Yeah. Anyway, so well, I showed I showed you the picture. So if you look carefully, it's it's a, a book. I didn't really advertise it properly. It's a book that came out in 2020 with, with Edwin Bex in Springer. Now, um, but anyway, so that cup. Um, this, these results are also mentioned there, but the main the main topic there is AB bimodule connections. But the point is, this whole concept generalizes to a bi category. Okay, now how do we use this formalism? Well, to this is this is actually Edwin's idea in his paper in JGP. Uh, fix we're going to first fix so B is going to be the algebra of time coordinates, the parameter space for the geodesics. So it's when we're just going to make it completely classical. So B is functions in one variable, C infinity of T, if you like. Um, and omega one B is going to be the classical differential calculus. So it's just generated by DT. And nabla B is just going to be zero, the flat connection. So nabla B is just uh, nabla B DT is zero. So the so in, in this project, um, B is going to be completely classical and one dimensional. Now it doesn't have to be, this whole concept generalizes vastly. You can do anything you like for B, but we're going to take, focus on this special case. Now, um, so, so we take this, uh, so we suppose that we have an AB by module E with B this particular trivial one, and A is our space time, quantum space time of interest. And uh, nabla E, therefore, as I told you, goes like this, and sigma E goes like this. And we require that nabla e sigma e nabla, double nabla of sigma e is zero. So that's what I was discussing. So that turns out. So you have to ask yourself, what does that mean? Okay. So let's analyze what that means. Um, so let's focus on e to be a tensor b. So that's an obvious a b by module connection. You can multiply from the left by a. You can multiply from the right by b. I'm going to call elements or b. I'm going to call them psi because they're going to be wave functions. Um, but what they are are time dependent. This is B is functions of time, functions in one variable. So, so, so really elements psi of E are time dependent elements of A. So they're paths in the algebra A. And if you analyze what, is a, what are the possible A, B bimodule connections, um, you'll discover that they have to have this form that nabla psi is the derivative in the time direction. So that's the derivative in this direction, plus psi times some time dependent element of A, that's what we call kappa. And and then evaluation of deep psi against time some time dependent left vector field. That means a left mod, so a vector field, a left vector field is a left module map from omega one. A, uh, and so the two data for the connection are um, a time dependent function and a time dependent uh, vector field. And you can build uh, 
the VEX connection and uh, in such a way as to be a bimodule connection. And here is the sigma. So um, it, it lands in the right spaces. And it's at any rate, you can see that it's something you could naturally construct. You don't have to worry whether it's where you get all possible connections this way, but, uh, but, but in fact you do. Um, now, double nabbler of sigma equals zero then has some content. And what is that content? Well, this, these are the, so when you analyze it, or when Edwin analyzed it, you've got these two equations here. So the, this, is, this has to be zero for all one forms omega, omega in, in omega one on, on, on our space time. And, uh, and that's, so that's one condition here. So that's an equation for the derivative of, X, of the vector field X is basically X, it's basically ignore all this, it's basically X dot is double nabla, is double, is double of, is double of X, is X X on nabla. So I'm going to convert this into a more familiar form in a minute, but we, we call this the geodesic velocity equation. And then the other one is this thing here, which you wouldn't even see classically, because classically sigma would be the flip map, so this would automatically be zero. So, um, so the real content is this geodesic velocity equation. Okay, so now let's justify that. So um, what is, uh, firstly, before I explain that, I'm going to, to convert it into a more palatable form. I'm going to convert, um, so we have, we, we, we switched to right module connection. So eight, so omega one has a right-handed levator beta connection, but a left connection, a right connection on omega one dualizes, uh, well, implies, not dualizes, it implies, um, a left connection, nabla L. Um, well, actually, I said this around the wrong way, haven't I? In most, so in, throughout the yellow book, we always work with left connections on omega one, but we need a right connection. So we start with a left connection, which you can, well, there are lots of examples. You can look up the levity to connection. It'll be a left connection, but we can convert it to a right one easily enough by, 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 um, by this. So our unadorned nabla will be a right connection, but we can get one from a left connection using the, the inverse braiding of, of L, uh, of nabla L. Now, in addition, we can take the left connection and we can dualize it to a right connection on the left vector fields. I'm going to call that nabla chi. Again, if it's unadorned, then it's the right connection um, on the space of left vector fields. So that's the left module maps. And then if you want, you can convert that to, uh, to a left connection, again, using sigma inverse, you get nabla hat. And why did I do that last thing? Well, if I convert to a left connection, then the output, if I apply nabla, to a nabla hat to a vector field, then the result lives in omega one tensor, the space of vector fields. And that can then be evaluated, I can then contract it, and I get a, an element of A. So that means we have a natural divergence uh, of a vector field, but it's only defined if you, for a left vector field, um, if the output of nabla is on the left, like that. So, um, okay. So, so we have a well-defined, so given this data, so given, the, given a quantum Riemannian geometry on our space-time algebra A, we have a levator vita connection. We can convert it to a right connection and also to a left connection on vector fields and also a right connection on vector fields. Um, from the left connection, we can build a divergence. From the right connection, we can do what we want, whatever we want with it. In particular, the geodesic velocity equation that I wrote before, which was an equation on all one forms omega, dualizes to this equation here. So requiring this equation on all omega is really a statement about vector fields. And it, so it just becomes this. Okay, so that's a, a little sort of, so that converts it from uh, a slightly roundabout equation on one forms to an actual equation on the vector field X. So now what you see is you see that the covariant derivative along X, right? So this nabla X, nab, X applied to the right-hand output of the right connection nabla chi, is literally the covariant derivative of a long xt. So what this says is, is that x dot plus a term which you wouldn't see classically, um, plus the covariant derivative of, uh, of x dot of x along x is zero. So this is, a, this is the geodesic autoparallel equation. So it's really quite amazing that all of that is captured in such a mathematically el very elegant statement that double nabla of sigma e is zero, okay? Um, now, in order to put this into practice, uh, so this is just the velocity fields. We haven't even discussed geodesics yet. So to dis discuss geodesics, we've got to have some kind of wave function. 
And so for that, we first need to fix a measure with respect to which our wave functions will have a probabilistic meaning or their norm square. So we're gonna fix a state, a background state or measure. So um, for example, if it was a Riemannian manifold, then this would be the standard Riemannian integration measure, um, Riemannian standard integration. So we fix an integration from the algebra to numbers, to complex numbers. And then we want all our constructions to behave well with respect to star structures. Now I haven't discussed this, but all our algebra should be star algebras. The differential calculi should be star differential calculi. Our connection should be star preserving, uh, but we still need our other data to be star preserving. And uh, in particular, we need X, the, ve the vector field X and the function kappa. They need to be compatible with star for everything to work. And that's what these two conditions are. So this is the condition on X. Um, for all omega. So we know what the, what the, what star, so star on a one form is just the extension of star on, on, on functions with, with star commuting with D. So we know what, me, what this means. We know what this means because this is in the algebra. Um, so that's a condition on this. And then we also require geometric compatibility. And that says that the integral of a divergent should be zero. So this is compatibility with star, this is compatibility with the divergent. So these are both very reasonable conditions to put on our background integration that we're going to use. Okay. Now, in fact, th those conditions are not that easy to analyze. So uh, not easy, that easy to solve. So we're going to solve them. And this is, this is the new result. So all of that what I've described so far was really in Edmund's original paper. It cleaned up a little bit. Um, but uh, what, so the, where we go a bit further in the formalism, uh, in, the, in the new paper is, um, is that uh, we're going to focus on the case of a twisted trace. So we're going to require that, that, that the integral obeys this twisted trace property. So if you, if you know about twisted cyclic cohomology, it's the kind of thing that you like. In particular, for quantum groups, there is this uh, automorphism, um, uh, which you have, uh, which, which uh, behaves like this. So um, twisted trace, and then we require that this automorphism, this algebra, um, automorphism um, should, should extend to, to differential forms in the obvious way. So it's differentiable. So we require it to be differentiable. And, um, and we suppose that the integral is non-degenerate in an obvious way. Then the theorem is that there is then a well-defined star operation on the space of vector fields. So HOM, the space of vector fields from omega one to chi does not carry it does have a natural bimodular structure, but it doesn't carry an automatic star structure. And this provides it. Um, so this says to take the connection, the, the, the braiding of, of Nabla hat, um, apply it here, then apply the evaluation of, uh, of vector fields and one forms, and then take the star. So that sort of all makes sense. This is for all one forms C. Um, now with that definition, you can discover that the star behaves the way you expect with respect to a left and right multiplication uh, of the bimodular structure of, of the space of vector fields. And, the, uh, and also this, um, okay, phi is, it's a change of notation. I didn't change it over. This phi is the integral. I've been calling phi the integral. So the integral of, uh, of, of this guy should be this. So that's already the kind of things we had in, in our constraint just above. And then we also discovered that it's compatible with the divergence like this. Um, and, uh, and so this is obviously also what you want. So this, these all justify the property, the star being a good definition. Now, once you have a good definition of star, you want to know what is a real vector field. And the right, so the right definition is not that x star equals x, but that x star equals uh, conjugation by this automorphism. Uh, that's what works nicely as justified by the remaining two parts of the proposition. So, um, well, the most important one, it says that if X is real, then the divergence also behaves nicely with respect to this automorphism zeta. And uh, what all of this allows you to do is in this setup, you can just take kappa to be a half divergence of X. And then if you go back here, you'll see that this is automatically solved. You have to sort of stick in these facts um, uh, and uh, maybe I won't do that exactly now, but um, but uh, you, you will you will obtain that this well in fact both of these two will be solved. So you solve the entirety conditions with this definition, 
and that means that uh, you're really good to go with the geometry. And before, we, it was a matter of guesswork as to what was a good star structure that worked. Okay, let's go. Let's uh, have a little interlude with the with the classic classical case. So in the classical case, mg is a Romanian manifold. Uh, or pseudo Romanian, if you want, um, and we just take the standard in, standard integration, um, which is the Lebesgue integration with the determinant weight. Um, now, in this context, we're going to take it in a kind of fluid dynamic point of view. If you have a vector field on a manifold, you can have the convected derivative, where you take um, where the rate the convected derivative of, of a function. Is it's any it's direct it is direct rate of change. So you've got an evolving fluid on the manifold. You can take its immediate direct rate of change plus the rate of change due to the motion of the particles. And so that is xt, the vector field, evaluated um, on df. So this is this is what people use in fluid dynamics. It's converted derivative for motion along a vector field. And so now uh, the observation in the paper is that if you do this classically, I don't believe anyone's ever done this before, um, if, uh, if you take um, our, if you take the geodesic velocity, if you take a geodesic velocity field, so you take the tangent spaces of all the geodesics uh, of an actual fluid flow of geodesics, then those velocity fields, I mean, maybe I should have said that, um, this equation here, I didn't really explain it very well. This, this is the auto parallel equation. But we're thinking of it as these, these vector fields are the tangent vectors of a fluid flow of particles. So each particle moves on a geodesic, each of their tangent vectors will give you a little direction and, that we, and they form a velocity. Uh, they, they, each, they each give you a little bit of a vector and they glue them all together. They all glue together to give you a, a vector field over the manifold. And so even classically, there's an interesting observation that, that the vector fields obey this equation here even before you discuss an actual geodesic. So, so, that's, that's, so that, that, this is what's happening in the fluid setting. This is, this is why we called it the geodesic, or why we called it the geodesic velocity equation. Um, but anyway, going back to what we're doing, uh, when, you, when you put that in, um, then you discover that the, co the convective derivative of the divergence, this function kappa that we talked about, is in fact, looks like this. And you see that here, this is like kinetic energy of the vector field. It's, it's the covariant derivative of the vector field, um, uh, the covariant derivative traced. And then there's a term, which is just the Ricci tensor viewed as a quadratic form evaluated on the vector field. So this is rather a nice equation. I think it gives you some insight into how GDSX appear. Now, if you know GR, then that's actually what happens. If you look at, let's say, a blob falling towards the earth, the way the stresses on the blob which uh, each, each bit of the blob moves along a geodesic, say, then, then the blob will change shape. Or, or if it's an actual fluid which is stuck to a particular shape, then that will appear as stresses on, 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 the, on, the, uh, on the blob. And this is why which tensor enters in the stress as part is the stress energy of the gravitational field. So that, that, that information about how things change shape as they move along geodesics, that's exactly captured classically in GR by the Ricci tensor. And that's what we see here. Because these vector fields, they are the motion for the geodesic for the geodesic flow, so it's it's quite satisfying that it appears. But it's much cleaner than the way that it normally appears in GR books, um, because it's just a tens it's a tensor equation. Okay, now armed with this with this classical observation, we can take this as the definition in the quantum case. So uh, I mean, we're going to explore that. So we're going to take. The the, the we can define the convective derivative. Um, okay, maybe what, this should have been a capital D here. Define the convective derivative as the direct derivative plus something which is x of df. But the only thing is, is we're going to symmetrize it. We're going to do it directly and then also on the other side. You, you don't have to, but this, this gives you nice uh, uh, properties of, of, of each of the pieces. Um, then we write then the covariant derivative of our particular geodesic velocity field. We're going to uh, we can expand it into two parts. One part resembles the kinetic term, so it looks like this. Um, I mean, this is the bit we want, but there's a little bit coming from the symmetrization, symmet symmetrized version of it. And then this part here is this part here. So again, it has the the part that we expect. Um, well, actually, it is just what it is. 
it doesn't look like Ricci tensor, we're gonna take it as a definition. So this is just whatever's left over. And so, so this should philosophically be some kind of quadratic Ricci tensor, Ricci, quadratic Ricci form, Ricci, Ricci of X, um, motivated from looking at quantum geodesics. So that's an, another new idea in this paper. And all we're going to do is in the remaining of the talk is just to explore these ideas in some examples. Okay. So that's really the end of the formalism part. So now let's see how all of this plays out in some examples. So I'm gonna show you two examples. Uh, first one is gonna be two by two matrices. So the algebra A is the algebra of two by two matrices. Um, now you have to say what the differential calculus is. And so in the book, in the, in the yellow book with, uh, with Beggs, we have this as a, main, as a main example throughout the book. And we take a standard basis, we take a, there's a standard central basis. So that means S and T commute. And that means that omega one is just spanned by S and T. Um, that's a, being a basis. And we and then define D to be uh, given by commutators with a certain function. This is an inner, inner calculus, and E12 is the matrix with one two, with one in the one two entry and zero elsewhere. And two one is the matrix with one in the two one entry. So commutator with these two components um, of, a, of, a, of a one form theta um, define the partial derivatives. So if I expand DA the way I would do classically, DA we the partial derivative in the s direction times the basis vector s and the partial derivative in in the t direction so these this defines d by ds and d by dt i will i mean or d, ds and d and d and dt derivatives in the two directions i'll use that notation later now this calculus um, as i said the omega 2 is, if you take the maximum prolongation it's usually too big but it's quite natural uh, but it does have these relations here so this is a bit unusual. The one forms, the basic one forms, actually commute, not anti-commute. And then, um, and then that's the that's the maximum prolongation of the first order calculus. And we can add some a couple more relations to bring it to the right size. So we add these relations here. Then the calculus has the dimensions you would expect for a two manifold, um, and the cohomology is also quite reasonable. Okay, now. Uh, a metric. I'm going to choose. Pick, 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 really, pick, you have written the cohomology yes. of M two. Uh, yes, this is this is this is just this is just defined as uh, the space of one forms of of closed one forms modulo exact one forms. So it's within the exterior algebra, within the non commutative within the differential graded algebra. Yes, but there is only one copy of M two. Yeah, uh, this this is yeah. Sorry, the uh, as a vector space, this is two copies. But it's it's really a module over the algebra. Uh, it's, it's so it's really it's really uh, it's really um, it's uh, so the so the so omega one is two dimensional over the algebra M two, and um, the uh, the cohomology is just generated by by S and T. So the generator of this is S and T. Uh, so they're both uh, so it's so it's two dimensional. I'm sorry, I didn't understand your question. Since uh, omega one is m two plus m, uh, okay, so the algebra is m two, yes. The algebra is yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. A is m two. The algebra okay. is m two. Okay, okay. So yeah, so so a basis is s and t, and I'm just saying the basis elements happen to be the generators of, mm. of the. Okay, of the okay, thank you. Um, now, uh, for the metric, I'm going to take uh, an element of omega one tensor omega one. Uh, it, I, I, over A is understood, I don't write over A all the time. Um, so I'm gonna take this one, it's, um, okay. Now you can analyze what are all the quantum levity vita connections. It turns out that there's a lot of them. Uh, there's actually a, um, you know, a four parameter family of them, at least it's in, it's in the yellow book. But we're gonna focus on one subfamily, uh, which is quite nice. So it has only one parameter, one parameter subfamily, depending on a parameter row, which should be imaginary. And then Nabla L, the, the, the quantum levity vita connection, left-handed quantum levity vita connection, then looks like this. And why have I focused on this? Well, for one thing, if you take the obvious lift, I is the obvious lift of a two form into, now normally you would say anti-symmetric pair of one forms, but the key thing is that wedge of it should be zero. So now it's not because of this funny relation, you actually want, um, I mean, not, not the wedge of it should be zero. It should, it should project back to, the, back to ST when you apply wedge. So, so uh, when you, so now the natural lift is this one because of these relations. So when you apply wedge, you'll get back ST. 
So this is actually a symmetric lift. Uh, but anyway, with this lift, you can compute the curvature of this and compute the retensor and it works out to be like this. In particular, it's Ricci flat when rho is plus or minus i. So the two by two matrices admit a quite a nice Ricci flat quantum Riemannian geometry. Okay, something you wouldn't necessarily have guessed um, uh, if, you, if you thought two by two matrices were trivial. Um, now for the integration, we'll just take the trace. This is the obvious trace on, a, on, on the algebra. And um, it obeys all our, all our, the main thing we had to check was that this was, well, obviously it obeys the star conditions we want, it's positive linear functional, but it also has to be compatible with the divergence. And um, so, the, so the geometric divergence of this connection, you take a basis, you take, so, so you take, a, take a vector field and you write it in a basis, Fs and Ft are the dual basis to S and T. So S and T are a basis of omega one, Fs and Ft are the dual basis, a general, a uh, vector field can then be written in that basis with some coefficients, x and t, x, s and x, t. These are just matrices. Um, and when you work it out, it just comes out to be this commutator. So, and what we want is um, for that to be compatible with, with, the, with, the, with, with, with integration. So the integral of a divergence should be zero. And that eventually, uh, um, well, that, so that works out. So then we can apply the definition of the proposition. And you, so we have a star definition. You follow the star definition. Again, it's quite simple in this particular case. And you just end up with Fs star as a vector field. It's star is minus Ft. And that means if you want a vector field to be real, of course, zeta here is, is, is trivial. It's the identity is a natural trace. If you want um, zeta, you, if you want it to be real, then um, uh, for a, a, ve a, ve a vector field to be real, um, you, you then end up for its coefficients have to obey this. So that's all we need to know from the general theory here. So now we know what condition equations we're solving and we know what, what, what reality properties we want. So now we write down the geodesic velocity equation. And, uh, and this is uh, over here. So we write down this equation. Now there's, there are two parts, if you remember. So the main part, the differential part was, nab, was x dot. And that works out to be this. So they look, they look uh, quite complicated, but you just have to work through the definition of, of the equation. Now, the other part was this thing which was trivial in the commutative case. It was basically identity minus sigma, and then xx applied to it should be zero. When you work it through, then it just comes out that these should anti-commute. Unfortunately, that isn't compatible with the reality structure. So there are no real solutions. Um, and in fact, so that's, a, that's a, a, a deficiency, if you like, of the general theory, but there's not really a problem. We can just, that you can actually just um, have a weaker version. So something slightly weaker than what Edwin talked about in, in his first paper is uh, what we call the weak improved auxiliary equation. And what it's, what, and how you obtain it is very, very simple. You just apply star, you take this, these equations, you, let's say you take the equation for XS, you apply star to, star to both sides, and then xs star will become minus x, xs star is minus xt. So this will become an equation for xt dot. And what you require is that when you apply star to this equation, you should get this equation. So compatibility of star, the minimal compatibility, turns out is this. And this turns out to be a weaker version of this. So this always implies this. And that's in, that's in the general theory. We discuss it a little bit. So there is a categorical thing, which is not as pretty as double nabler of sigma e equals zero. It's, you have to have double nabler of sigma e has to have a, a driving term. There's a little bit more of the geometry go, going on in the geometry. But, but anyway, what it boils down to is, is that uh, is something very concrete. You just apply star. So this equation is just, this improved. so it turns out the meaning of this equation was a slightly too strong version of compatibility of star with the, with the velocity equation. And the weakest version of that is just to apply star to it and see what you get. So, that, so this, is, this, is the, this is the slightly improved auxiliary or weaker auxiliary equation. In any case, you want everything to be compatible with star. So you had to impose this. Um, so then, uh, so now you know, so you, so you solve this star constraint first, and then you solve these equations. And now I haven't discussed the actual geodesic flow. I've managed to uh, put that off to the end. So as I said, we began with the connection nabla E and psi was the wave function. So the thing we've been discussing all the time, the velocity vector field, but the thing which is actually has the particles is the probability distribution psi. 
Now, in our case, we're doing non-Euclidean geometry. So psi, uh, even the modular psi squared, so psi star, psi star, psi star psi plays the role of mob psi squared, but psi star psi lives in uh, uh, in the algebra A. Not, um, so it's not exactly a property density as such if it, in the, in the non-commutative case, but it has positivity properties and we treat it as a positive, as a, in the same way as the property density. Um, anyway, the equation for the amplitude flow, you need an equation which tells, tells you that the velocity fields that you began with are indeed the tangent uh, uh, ve vectors of the, flu of the fluid flow. And so that turns out to be just this equation, that double the nabla of psi is zero. So the spine module connection takes on a physical meaning. It, it sews together the amplitude, uh, the velocity vector field with the, with the particle flow as expressed by the wave function psi. So just to summarize, we've, we've taken the usual concept of a geodesic, which is you start with particles moving on a manifold, and then you work out their velocity. And we've done, we've, we've torn, we've, we've taken that apart and done it and glued it back together in the reverse order. We first solve for the velocity vector field and then afterwards we figure out what was the flow of the of the particles. Okay, so it's a little, it's, it's a un, very unusual point of view, uh, but I think a very creative one and it's and it's what works and it's geometrically very nice, right? This is a very simple equation. So the equation in our case, remember that psi was just given by the vector field itself. So it just comes out of this. So you can see here that psi dot is controlled by the vector field x. The derivative of psi in the x in the s direction is is d is xs, and the derivative of psi in the t direction is xt. And there's a little bit here which is the divergence. This compensates for the non-trivial divergence of the vector field. It's also what you would have classically. Okay, so so we solve this equation. Here's the solution. So first thing you do. Let's look at the time here. Okay, first thing you do. Is you um, you you apply the auxiliary, the improved auxiliary equation for real real x. So you cut because the equation you first thought of was a little too complicated. This is way too complicated to solve even on Mathematica. Um, so, but you, if you apply the reality constraint first, apply this constraint first, you can solve this constraint, and then you will end up with um, uh, with a four parameter space. And xs have to look like this, and xt is just minus xs star. So, so all of the data of the velocity vector is contained in these four parameters, a, a, b, c, d. They're all time dependent. And then you apply the velocity equation uh, on on this on on these type of, of velocity fields, and then you discover that actually it simplifies quite a bit, and you just get that c and d are uh, are constants, and a dot is 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 b, and b dot is minus a. So this is basically a, a simple harmonic motion. So that tells you that um, the velocity vector field looks like this. So that's the general solution for some initial values, alpha, beta, gamma, delta of A, B, C, D. So that's the general solution. And so now we've solved our velocity vector fields. I just have to show you some geodesics by choosing a psi. And I show you, I'm gonna show you an example where I've set all the initial values to be one. To be one. Um, well, I'm, well, I've chosen these values here for the initial values. And uh, and I've chosen um, psi to be uh, to be the identity matrix to start with. Then I let the whole system evolve. Oh, do you know how x evolves? And I work out. I, I solve this. Well, we solve this numerically. So here's a close-up of the answer in the range zero to two pi. So this is t equals zero. And I've, I've shown the different cards. I've shown the different components. Remember, psi is an element of the algebra. So it's it's actually a two by two matrix. So it has four entries, psi one one, psi one two, et cetera, and they're all evolving in time. So, so psi one one is the blue path, and uh, psi uh, two two is the is the is the red path, etc. And psi one two and psi they both start at one zero because I start with the identity matrix. Psi one two and psi two one they're off diagonal. They start at zero, and what you discover is that. That the psi that the that the that the the off diagonal ones stay around zero, the off di the diagonal because they began at zero and they stay close to zero. They keep coming they keep coming back to zero, and the um and the the diagonal ones they began as one and they stay of modulus one around modulus one. And so if you plot it out to a large large um, t, you get this very pretty picture. The ye the yellow the green and yellow are the off diagonals and the red and blue are the diagonal entries. And you can see that. They, they stay large. 
this is a reflection of our initial starting point. If I took a different matrix to start with, I would get a different picture. Okay. Now, very quickly in five minutes, I just want to show you another example. I left it a little bit late, but uh, okay. I've still got nine minutes according to my uh, according to my my, my phone. So um, okay. So I'm going to show you one more example, if I may. It's going to be the fuzzy sphere. So this is a very uh, well-known algebra. This is, this is just the this is just the um, Kirillov constant quantization of of uh, a co-adjoint orbit of SU two. So that means it has the relations of the enveloping algebra of SU two, uh, but it also has a sphere relation, which is which is that the quadratic uh, or quadratic Casimir is a constant. This particular value is chosen um, so that this is a deformation of a unit of a unit sphere. Um, and uh, I mean, you could have normalized it differently. This is just the convenient normalization. Now, what is the calculus on this, right? This is more or less standard. What is the calculus on this? Well, I'm going to take a central basis. This is again in the yellow book. We take a central basis, um, SI, um, and we define the derivatives, the partial, der the, the D is a from a function, from a coordinate function to a one form is going to be given like this by the epsilon tensor, the totally anti-symmetric tensor. And the exterior algebra, I say that these are Grassmann and SIs, and but the, but they're not but they're not closed. The DSI is given like that, so you have to check that it all works. But this gives you an exterior algebra, and um, the then we have a natural metric. Now, because these are central, this these GIJ should 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 have constant coefficients, and for any any uh, in my paper with in this paper here. We solved that to find the levity to connection with in the case of constant coefficients. So there's there is a, there is a unique quantum levity to connection given by these Christoffel symbols. You can work out the Ricci scalar, and it turns out to be given as a function of the matrix. Turns out to be this. So so G G is a is a is a is a three by three matrix, symmetric uh, symmetric uh, real symmetric matrix, and this is and this is its uh, um, curvature. So that's how we do quantum gravity on the fuzzy sphere. That's not the topic of today's talk. Um, now we'll define integration, and the way we'll do that is to say, well, this has this algebra has an SU two symmetry, so we'll take every monomial in the in the coordinate algebra, and we'll expand it under the rotational symmetry and look at the rotationally invariant part, and I'll call that the integral. So basically, expanding this in non-commutative harmonic uh, harmonic um, uh, series, and um, and uh, so that's the integral. And you can check that it is compatible with the geometric divergence. There's a divergence of a vector field just turns out to be these guys. These DKs are defined by, by the exterior derivative. So the D, DK of, of XI is just given by this tensor here, by this, by this here. So these are just defined by the choice of basis. So, so the, D, the DK acting on the, X, the coefficients of XK of the vector field, should, should that's kind of what you expected. Um, and then you go through the procedure. This time, what you'll get is that the general structure gives you that uh, that these basic one forms are uh, self-adjoint, and that tells you that the coefficient should be should be self-adjoint uh, as elements of the algebra. And now we're going to solve it. And I'm only going to this. We just we just really scratched the surface of this model. We're only going to solve it in the in the case of const. Um, well, let's have a look first. We 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 uh, we, we we want to have. So these xi, they are just the components of the vector field x on the basis vector. So they are, they are just the, um, yeah, and we require these to be stuff joints, as I just said. This is the velocity equation that we have to solve. Again, the this one, the original one from double nabla of sigma e equals zero is a bit too strong, but there's a weaker one just coming from applying star to this. So this is the minimal compatibility with star um, auxiliary equation. So we have to solve this and this, okay? So I've only scratched the surface of this. We, we'll do the solution in the case where xi's are constants on, on the fuzzy sphere. So the xi's are, are uh, real numbers, but and they're constant as elements of the fuzzy sphere, they're, they're, they're multiples of one, so they're constant on the sphere. Um, so that is like a, a, um, a, a rigid motion almost, um, okay? But even this is pretty complicated. So you, you put this into the equation. We take the levity beta connection for the metric, which is from the paper I cited. And I'm just going to focus on the case where G is actually diagonal. So there's some three eigenvalues, and it's a sort of typical diagonal case. And so then the equations look like this, which have a very nice symmetry to them. They're a bit like the NAM equation. Um, you can define these auxiliary quantities. Um, 
for, uh, and then you can, then the equations just look like this. Uh, well, the, you stick these into here, and then you, um, so I didn't say it at all well. F from, from these equations, you get this, where mu i's are, are defined like this. I define mu as this, as this combination for some arbitrary constants, and then I have a general solution that looks <laughs> like that. So this is the, this is the general solution. The, um, if I take, for example, the 431 metric, it's a random metric, then I've got these elliptic Jacobi functions uh, for the solution. And let's just plot that. So again, we've got to, well, we, we can, well, I, I'm, not, I'm gonna show you the plot. So this is, this is a plot of X. This is the particular flow. Um, and then I'm, and now we've also got to solve the Schrodinger type flow, the, the amplitude flow. So again, the amplitude is now an element of the fuzzy sphere. I'm going to just focus on a tiny piece of the theory where we look for functions on the fuzzy sphere, elements of the fuzzy sphere, which are linear. So in Xi, so they look like this. And so then psi dot, uh, well, it's given by, by um, those DXI, but the DXI, they actually can be written as commutator. So it looks like this. And um, so the bottom line is, is that psi, when you take this particular form of psi, then it just looks like this. Um, so that's actually easy. That's because that's so that's so if x if x was a constant, if x was a constant, then this would just be a, a, a rotation um, of, of of this three vector. But x is not a constant, so x is this x is this thing here. Psi star x is the is the probability density to, uh, and it's some pro positive element of, of the algebra. The um, here's what psi looks like as a vector. The three components of psi uh, it starts off, but uh, over here somewhere. And it meets itself here, and meets itself here. If you take it out to a large distance, there's actually a hole through which it doesn't go. So again, we have a similar phenomenon that we had in the other one, that the geodesics are kind of limited to by, by where they started. They started at one, zero, zero, and it sort of remembers that. Okay, um, I think that's probably all I want to say. I should just mention that this whole thing uh, in the paper, we solve it also for the discrete fuzzy sphere uh, with other examples. And because this fuzzy sphere, if you set lambda p to be one over n, then there's an n, then the standard n-dimensional representation of, of SU2 descends to the algebra. And, uh, and, and, um, and if you quotient out by the kernel of that, then the algebra just becomes n by n matrices. So that is the usual finite dimensional fuzzy sphere. And everything I've done, I've said works on that too. And you can solve equations on that as well. And that's, that's in the paper. Okay, uh, last topic. Um, sorry, this was a little bit rushed. Um, okay, just to mention this Ricci tensor that I discussed at the beginning. If you take a general connection on the fuzzy, on the fuzzy sphere, and um, this is its torsion tensor um, in terms of the connection coefficients gamma, this is the Ricci scalar as computed in, in, in the other paper on quantum gravity. Now, if you apply the formalism we discussed today, you, um, you take a vector field X, um, you compute that quantity r of x. So these depend, these don't have to obey the equation anymore. They're just motivated by that. They're just things defined on any vector field. This is the Ricci quadratic form. And this was the kinetic term. So the kinetic term works at what you expect as a co-major derivative along x like this. Um, and the Ricci, the quadratic Ricci looks quite a lot like what we expected. This is the Ricci tensor, which was found geometrically. So this is the thing which vanished in the, in, uh, would have vanished in the first example. Um, uh, and this is an extra term, which isn't there classically. I'm not quite sure what that means, but this just gives you a flavor of there's something quite interesting going on there. And um, I think I pretty much have to wrap here. Sorry, I've gone over time. Um, but uh, just so uh, we've just seen this general framework, you have to relax this condition slightly. This is a slightly weaker version of which doesn't have the GDZ, the, the auxiliary equation that was too strong. There's some notion of a, of a Ricci tensor that comes out of this. We've seen how it works in examples and we can explore the physics. This is in my other paper. Okay, thanks very much. Okay, thank you. Thank you, great, great talk. Nice pictures. So the comments, questions. I can actually start with one is, um, so there was a, so you have this, this flow on M2C for instance. Yeah, I, I was wondering if you if you kind of look at um, the state space of this M two C, or even the pure states, can you actually uh, transfer that flow 
to the state space to uh, to see <laughs> it's like a like a Schrodinger Heisenberg picture essentially. Um, yeah. So yes, you can. So there is there. We, we, so in in the other paper on quantum mechanics, we also discussed the Heisenberg picture. Um, so you can do that. Um, so yeah, we don't. Yeah. So so the uh, so the answer is yes. So you but it's really not that deep because you just take this equation and you just write it as a corresponding equation on the states. But remember that you don't see as much. You don't see um, not on the states on the on the elements of of the algebra. So. Um, I think there's, I think the Heisenberg picture you referred to is really, is really not, it's not, it's not really about states. It's about, um, so for, uh, maybe it's, maybe it's only also confusement because you, you talk about the algebra A, M2C, yeah. but yeah. you, I think you view it as a wave function, these elements, right? Y yeah. Yeah. Psi, Whereas, psi, yeah. So it's um, not the observables essentially. Yeah. If it, so if A is space time and our space time is being quantized, then, then A would be, if you want the algebra observables, yes. So, so we're taking a quantum mechanical view of it. Um, so, so yes, that's already, that's already it, is, it is quite confusing. So that's already the, that's already, think of that as a state. So psi star psi squared, so psi, psi star psi in this example. Um, so these are our matrices. If you look at psi star psi, you'll discover, some, you'll discover that um, it's, uh, its trace is constant because psi star psi, the, the integration is 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 uh, is the trace, and and uh, so the so so it's, we're thinking of psi star psi as a property density, and what that really means is is that the integral of psi star psi is a constant one. So um, so the, so the, in this picture, the, the positive linear functional enters uh, just in order to give a probabilistic interpretation of the elements of the algebra. So the so the, in particular the integral. Um, uh, the integral, the element I called input, which is the trace here, is a particular positive linear functional, and uh, it would be if it was a quantum mechanics, it would be the area under the curve. It would be, it would be a constant, uh, and so that's so that we have that same same point of view here. Now you could, so we don't really consider other states in this picture, um, but but you could, um, so you could take a non-commutative, you could you could go further, and you could define a state. Uh, another positive linear functional, um, which is the integral of psi blank psi star blank psi, if you see what I mean, and that would be the analog of in physics of the expectation value, uh, and then you could apply that to to operate to other operators. So that you can, in other words, you can take the whole philosophy of quantum mechanics, but it has been um, relative has been generalized with the space time that you're working on is itself a non-commutative space, but the way that C star algebras work, it all just fits very nicely. But on the Sorry, other I'm hand, I mean, usually, so you usually take like a C star algebra as, as the, the algebra of observables. And on that, you would consider states. Well, we, 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 we only consider one different. different. You, you we, could, we consider elements. Yes, that's right. Yeah. yeah. So, a, so a positive, we would consider a positive element of the C star algebra as playing the role of a density of fluid. So a state. Uh, well, if you call that a state, but yeah, if you want, yes, yes, a state. And, um, um, and then uh, that's right, but but we're interested not in the amplitude itself, rather than the density. So and that's where the half came from. Because if you look if you look if you look at a flow of a density, you would have divergence here, whereas we have half the divergence here, and that's because psi is the square root of of the of the density, if you want geometrically. So um, so it's all been adjusted to go now. Of course, in classical geometry, for a classical Riemannian manifold, everything would remain real. So you wouldn't even care whether it was psi or psi squared, they'd really be equivalent. Um, but, but it turns out, that, that was my last slide, in fact, that um, when you look at its other models, when the space time is quantum, you discover that the first order corrections from, from Planck scale, they actually make the wave function uh, complex. So psi may start off everything real, and then really we've, we've taken a quantum mechanical point of view, but we're just working with real functions, right, classically but they start getting quantum corrections. And then and once they get quantum corrections, then it looks more like quantum mechanics. And then you can have interference patterns and things like this. So there's a lot of physics yet to be explored on this. Um, and, and so, um, but the nice thing about it is, is that we can explore that physics using the formalism and ideas of quantum mechanics, like, like you just said. So, uh, so we literally think of, um, think we take a quantum mechanical view of the space time and, um, uh, and interpret like, like, like you said. 
Thanks. I think there was another question. Adam, is that right? Uh, yes, yes, yes. Uh, I would like to ask, uh, in fact, quite general question, how this theory of quantum Riemannian geometry is related to the theory of spectral triple? As uh, I remember, yeah. you said at the beginning that uh, sometimes you end up with a spectral yeah. triple, but sometimes yeah. not. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the way the way I view it, I mean, some, some you know, cons, uh, people who follow cons work don't like it when I say this, but I think of, the way I think of it is, is that we're starting at the very bottom. We're building up the layers of junk. We start with the manifold, which is an algebra. I mean, we start with an algebra, like a set. Then we put a differential structure on it, which is like omega one. And then we build up the tangent bundle. And then we look at, well, that's tan tan the cotangent bundle. And then we look at the metrics. And then we look at levity of the connection. And then we introduce spinners. And then we introduce the Clifford action. And then we eventually build ourselves the Dirac operator, right? But what Kahn does is he starts at the very top. He says, let's axiomatically define a Dirac operator. And, and then for him, it's the opposite problem. He's defined already what he means by Dirac operator, something obeying his axiom, the petrol triple. And for him, he's got to work backwards and discover what was the differential calculus, what was the metric, if there was some kind of metric, what was the connection, if there was some kind of connection. And, you know, and that's actually uh, much harder. I mean, it, it's, um, it can be done in the case of a classical, if you apply console into a classical manifold, you will get back the classical manifold structure. Dirac operator, but it's a non commutative case, it's very hard to do. So we're coming at it from the bottom, and he's coming at it from the top. And there are examples where the two things meet. So in the paper in some in the yellow book in chapter 8.5, we devote that section exactly to this question. And we give some examples from our papers. For example, on the cuneiform sphere, you can follow this procedure, you can take the quantum Riemannian geometry, the quantum metric, the quantum levity via connection, introduce a Clifford structure, build ourselves a Dirac operator. And then you can see if it obeys cons axioms. And, and, it, and it does more or less. That you have to introduce this automorphism zeta. So it's a twisted version of cons axioms. Um, but it does more or less obey that. And there's also examples on two by two matrices where it fits, fits exactly. So you can sometimes fit exactly two cons axioms, but, but uh, it does not guarantee two. Okay. Okay, thank you. And I have one more question, if I could. Uh, could you say something about this uh, fact of the non-uniqueness of the levitch vita connection since yes. as yes, I recall correctly, it was the case in this uh, yes. finite dimensional? Yes, universe. yes, it's, it, that's right. It's a very interesting question. So it may just be that we should impose more conditions, but if you look at the classical theorem, the levitch vita connection is unique, that depends very much on the symmetries of the equations you're solving. So as soon as, as, soon as you work in a quantum geometry, there's no guarantee. However, it's very often the case that for, for examples which are deformations of Q deformed examples, of, of classical examples, or which are quite close to them, for example, the Fatih sphere, non the torus, they all have unique levity beta connections. But there's no theorem that guarantees that. I mean, there are some approaches. There's some work by Biswas Chakrabarti where they try to have formalism where it's guaranteed to have a unique, I think Jani Landy was also on that paper. So there, you, could, you could impose some conditions to give you uniqueness of levity beta, but certainly in, in our book, we take the view that is simply simply a feature of classical geometry, which is not replicated in the quantum case. But in many examples, it is indeed unique, but there are also many examples where there are two solutions. Let me say something about that. To so go back to this equation here, that being metric compatible is, is that this should be zero, right? Nabla G should be zero. So this should be zero. And there is a Nabla here, but there's also a Nabla implicit in Sigma because Sigma was obtained from Nabla, right? Sigma is the difference of these two Nablas. So this actually is a quadratic equation. So unlike the usual levity beta connect, uh, condition, which is linear in Nabla, this equation is quadratic in Nabla. And that means that there are typically two solutions. And so in, in many cases that are close to classical, there's a unique solution which has a classical limit and a unique solution which blows up in the classical limit. And so that's, that's a very typical situation. Uh, but nevertheless, it depends on the example. So the example of the two by two matrices, they turned out there's a five parameter moduli. So um, that's, a, that's a story of where we are. It doesn't mean that there couldn't be a better theory which has more conditions on Nabla, um, which ensure uniqueness. But I think the natural thing is really to have the natural thing in, in deformed examples it is, is really something quadratic to have, to, because it's quadratic, it's quite natural to have two. And it's, and it's quite interesting to, to figure out what is the geometric meaning of these, what I call deep quantum connections, which are, which are the other solution of the quadratic different from the one that has a classical limit. Okay. Okay, thank you. Thank you. All right, thanks. So. Uh, Sean, it's Ludwig, hi. 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 Sorry. Sean, can you say one a little bit more about how in the classical limit only one survives? So how you 
Uh, well, again, this is really just seen in examples. Um, so in the paper with, um, uh, yeah, I don't have slides for that, unfortunately, but um, in, the, in the paper with, in the paper with Beggs uh, on called uh, Gravity Induced by Quantum Space Time, we take the Kaplan Minkowski space time with, the three, with its, uh, actually, we do it in two dimensions, and we do it with the 2D calculus. And then we, and, and then we, we solve it for a general metric, a general, we solve the whole system in general with the maximum generality, uh, um, more or less. And then we discover that, uh, that you know, everything is quadratic, so you get, a, you get a quadratic equation for the coefficients of Nabla. Okay. Um, what I can say is like this. Typically, typically, um, sigma come. You have to pick a pick a basis for for omega omega one, and then sigma comes down to sigma comes down to a tensor um, that you well. So you you what we do in that paper is we parameterize the possible forms of sigma in terms of some parameters, and then because the calculus is in it, something I didn't tell you, but a key theorem in all of this is that if the calculus is inner, if there's a theta element. <laughs> If, 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 if there's an element, okay? If there's, a, if there's an element theta, the commutator um, generates the omega one. So if it, the calculus is inner, it turns out that all bimodule connections are determined just from sigma. So you can turn this around and you just get a bunch of equations for the coefficients of sigma. And then those equations are always, are, 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 are always quadratic because Nablo is determined from sigma. So actually, so, so it becomes very concrete. You can see it in that paper. You will always get a quadratic equation. And then but it's a quadratic equation in, in many variables. So whether you get exactly two or you get you know, more depends on, on the exact equation. But in that particular model, it just comes down to two for the two natural ones. Okay, so um, maybe I should say a bit more. Uh, so basically you, you'll get a quadratic equation for the tensor sigma, but that doesn't mean there's two solutions because sigma has, has many indices. But when you put on the star structure, and the requirement of zero torsion uh, and those things, then in that paper, it all just comes down to quadratic equation, a conic, a conic that, 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 that's, that, the, that the parameters of sigma have to obey. So I'm sorry, I can't tell you the general theory here because it hasn't really been analyzed. But in that paper, you can see it and you can see there's a parameter lambda, which is the lambda or, ca or kappa, the, the kappa Minkowski space time deformation. And you can see that, uh, that as, as lambda, kappa is one over lambda. Uh, so as lambda goes to zero, you can just see that one of the solutions blows up and one of them uh, doesn't blow up. So I'm sorry, Ludwig, I, I don't have a, there is no, it's a great- Okay, it's a, okay thanks. <laughs> there's it's no good answer. Okay, thanks. I, I would just say one thing though, sorry, um, that we wrote a paper, Edwin and I, called Poisson Riemannian Geometry, where we took this whole framework and we looked at the deformation of it. So you start with a classical Riemannian geometry and you ask, can you deform it to an infinitesimal quantum Riemannian geometry obeying all these axioms? And, and so there you can analyze this question. You can analyze what is the data for a quantum connect connection. And there you are guaranteed to stay close to the, to the Levi Civita one, to the, to the classical one, because you're deforming it. Um, and, and, and there you, uh, but you still have conditions on uh, which, which and, and that's all described in the, in the yellow book in, in chapter nine. Okay. okay, thanks, thanks, perfect. Thanks also for the question. So, Adam, I think you still have the end race, but it's uh, taken care of, right? Adam? Sorry? No, you still have your hand raised, but I think that was from uh, Yes, it is. Yes. No yes. I have to lower it. OK, no problem. OK, thanks a lot for all okay. the questions and the nice talk, Sean. So. Thanks, everyone. Thanks for being a great audience. Bye. And we we'll see each other next week. Uh, in two weeks, sorry. Bye. Bye, everyone. OK, bye. Bye.